I'm very sorry to say I don't have a video. I'm between you guys and uh, getting out of here. I just have a lot of slides with a lot of numbers in them. So I will try to be as quick as possible. So, see, I'm, I'm the only one without the safe harbor uh, disclaimer in it. That's good. Okay, um, so over the course of the day, uh, you know, what you've seen is we're executing on our strategy, uh, the targets we set out at the Capital Markets Day 18 months ago. We've reconfirmed our revenue target, and I'll go on to confirm our targets on cash flow and profitability. Esteban's given you um, a good insight as to why we're so excited by the opportunity in Colombia. Um, <clears throat> this will be a key driver to the group's uh, performance over the next 12, uh, 18, and 24 months. And uh, I think the guys have just given you a great uh, insight as to what we mean by the digital lifestyle and, again, why we believe it will drive our medium-term future. So what I want to do now is put a financial wrap around what you've just heard. And then, um, as you've heard, uh, Hans Holger will, will finish us off. <clears throat> so uh, let me start. If I look back at the business uh, in 2012 when we set these targets, I think the business, business was quite different. Um, mobile represented 86% of our revenues. We had a 77% gross margin. We had an EBITDA margin of 41%. As Hans Holger said in the opening presentation, we knew that couldn't last. We were already seeing declines in some of the high margin uh, voice and SMS. And we set about a transformation to the digital lifestyle <coughs> that the company you've heard about today. Now, we're midway through that transformation. But from this slide, you can see that by 2017, uh, which was the date of our original uh, five-year plan, we're going to have transitioned the group. We're going to have reduced our dependence on mobile and reduced uh, our dependence on Central America. So by 2017, we expect, roughly speaking, about 60% of our revenues to come from mobile, 30% to come from cable, and the balance will come from M M MFS and, and other digital services. And about half of our business will be in South America. But this is the evolution. Um, you can see the change in the composition of our margins. The mix shift will probably see our gross margin go from 77.6% in 2012. We were 75.2% in the first half of 2014. And we'll probably end up about 72% over the next couple of years. <clears throat> and this is an, a mix impact we're having to deal with of about 600 basis points. However, we have a fantastic opportunity. And <clears throat> uh, we have a fantastic opportunity to address this, to move margins up in each of our key areas. Uh, key to this is to continue the revenue growth, which I think we're doing. Uh, Colombia grew by 27% in the first half. Africa grew by 14%, 13%, uh, uh, cable grew by 14%. So, you know, we're seeing strong growth in our core uh, businesses. But in order to meet our EBDA guidance, um, as well as delivering revenue growth, uh, we need to maintain our cost disciplines. Um, and I'll spend a bit of time talking about this later in the presentation. In short, uh, we continue to see uh, an EBITDA margin of around 35% as our target. And I view that as an achievable objective for the business as we currently have it. <clears throat> so I've now been in the business uh, just over 100 days. And um, I thought I would uh, tell you the key themes that I'll be focusing on. Put simply, they are growth, profitability and cash flow, and capital allocation. So let me start with uh, a look at the growth. As, as I've just said, and, and as you've heard throughout the day, Millicom is a great growth machine. Um, you know, roughly half of the revenue growth to our 2017 target will come from inorganic sources. That's mainly uni. But the balance of about $2 billion will come from organic revenue growth. Overall, this is growth of over 10% per annum and an organic growth rate of around 6%, <coughs> which remains uh, you know, ambitious for any group. So our current run rate is encouraging, driven by Columbia Cable and Africa, as I said. Um, you know, and uh, as, we, as you've heard earlier in the day, we've been run running at an annual um, growth rate of 8 to 9% in local currency. That's running at 5 to 6% in US dollars. 
Let me look at a bit more detail about the drivers of this growth. The slide shows the evolution uh, of our mobile recurring revenues. From the first quarter of 2012, you can see that we've just seen a massive growth in data revenues. It's almost double uh, what we had in the first quarter of 2012. And uh, we'd expect them to be getting close to about a billion dollars uh, by the end of this year. A few statistics. Today, our data penetration is around 23% of our base, compared to 8% of the last uh, CMD. Still well, well below where we think we can get it. Today in LATAM, around about 80% of our sales um, are smartphones. Nearly 60% of the new smartphone activations are coming from unsubsidized entry-level phones. And <clears throat> And as the slide shows, we're seeing good levels of data growth across all of the businesses. Now you can see the evolution we expect on this slide. Today we're about 65% voice, around 10% SMS, and under just under 25% is uh, data stroke non-voice. I think as, as you all appreciate, data is declining everywhere. We're seeing an underlying uh, voice decline averaging about 3% per annum. This is probably a little bit uh, slower than we originally expected. And so we now expect voice to account for around about 55% of our recurring revenues by, uh, by 2017. By contrast, we're seeing SMS declining much more quickly. Uh, in some of our bigger Latin markets, uh, SMS revenues are now declining at a rate in the mid-20s. However, as I just said, data is growing strongly. And it's going to be around 40% of our mobile recurring revenue by 2017. <clears throat> I think that uh, target is probably a little bit lower than we originally communicated. But that isn't lack of ambition. That is simply that voice is declining at a slightly slower rate than we originally anticipated. We're still very confident that data will um, exceed 50% of our overall revenues. So perhaps the biggest change in our business uh, is the growth in the cable contribution. Uh, with the uni merger, that's going to increase um, the revenues from cable from about half a billion dollars today to getting on for $2 billion. Represents about a quarter of the group's revenues, uh, and we expect that will continue to, uh, to grow strongly. Today, we've got about 2.5 million homes passed. Uni will add another 3 million. Um, and our aim is to increase that number uh, to around about 8 million homes passed. We've got a, a uh, penetration of 34% today. RGU's at 1.4 times. ARPU's near the $30 mark that you've heard. Um, and as you can see from this slide, we've got a long way to go on the double and triple play. So, so we think it's got great potential. I think uh, the presentations you've heard today really support that. So hence our view, uh, the cable, and, and just to uh, contrast with what Martin said earlier in the day when he talked about his $2 billion uh, cable target, that, is, um, uh, that, was, that was retail, that was the residential cable. I'm talking about our total cable business, including B2B. But if you include that, um, you know, we'd expect it to contribute about 30% of our revenues um, by 2017. All right, let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about UNE um, and the impact on the group. I think uh, much of this slide has been sort of forestalled by the questions you asked me earlier, but I'm going to persevere anyway. So I think the first thing I want to say is, is that um, it's, it's, it's still work in progress for us. It's ongoing. We're pulling together details of our financial plan and our integration plan at the moment. You know, in reality, this merger is less than six weeks old. Uh, and uh, as Esteban said, he's been with us for at least a week, probably two weeks. So, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, we're at the very, very early stage on it. And whilst we remain uh, extremely excited by it, I think we have to temper that excitement with what our current uh, sort of visibility on the, um, the future is. So what we, what we can do today is really only show you a glimpse of this business and the potential of the business. The chart shows the hysteric uh, performance. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of numbers uh, flying around. The difference is our local currency, US dollars, IFS, our local gap. We're not going to get too hung up by the historics, but what you have here is uh, basically IFRS, US dollar uh, numbers. 
Um, you know, we see that it has grown, um, it's been growing relatively solidly, um, but we, we do think there's more to come. EBITDA margins, as you've heard, were around 24%, capital intensity around 15%. We expect that UNI will contribute um, around about $550 million of revenue for us, uh, for the Millicom Group, for the rest of this year. And we'll add about $120 million of EBITDA and, and roughly the same in CapEx. So we're not expecting a cash contribution uh, for the remainder of 2014. <coughs> now, it's important to note two things on this. One is that this is not specific guidance on UNI. This is simply the impact of UNE for this financial year. Uh, if you start grossing up these figures, you don't necessarily get to the right answer in terms of where this business will be going in 2015. The second thing, and this is a more important message uh, for us, the impact on the group numbers will be about 100 basis points in this financial year. So, you know, in terms of the impact on the EBITDA, including UNE, for the group as a whole, uh, it, will, it will hit us by about 100 basis points. But, you know, I think you've heard why we're really excited about this. We think we've got a great opportunity to uh, increase the contribution um, and even more so if we take the synergies into account. And, and again, you've heard Esteban say pretty early stage on the synergies, but from what we've seen so far, we are, we, you know, we're pretty excited by what we can see there and we think that um, they will prove to be um, pretty solid. Okay, MFS. Um, now, you know, I think, I think at the last CMD, we were, you know, we were, we were excited by the prospects for MFS, and as you've heard today, we're no, no less excited, but perhaps we've got a more sober view of the likely trajectory of that growth. Um, today, the business is growing north of 50%. That is no mean feat for any startup. You know, we are now running about $100 million of revenue on this business, and, uh, you know, we've got some really quite impressive uh, statistics. For instance, we've got seven and a half million users. We're processing now over 400 million transactions a year. We have a transaction value in excess of $8 billion. So, you know, in a short period of time, MFS has established itself as a major business for us. Uh, it's, still, it's one we're only still starting with. We've got many more countries and many more products to introduce. Uh, it's developed nicely, um, but it's probably not developed as fast as we'd hoped for. We remain bullish on the, the prospects, but um, you know, we see those achievements um, being a little bit further in the future than uh, perhaps we communicated last time. So how does all that add up? And you can see from this slide that we've, you know, what we've done is we've mildly upgraded our revenue uh, range to 8.6 to $9.4 million. Uh, Hans Holger has set the target. He set the target internally to the group uh, to the business that we will exceed $9 billion, and he's, he's reiterated that today. As I've just said, we, <coughs> we've downgraded our MFS uh, revenue targets uh, within the 2017 framework. We now expect a further 200 to $400 million of revenue. But this shortfall will be taken up by the cable uh, revenues and a slight upward revision from our mobile uh, business on market share gains and a slightly lower uh, voice attrition I talked to, about earlier. So, since I've arrived, the thing I have been struck by is um, this extraordinary focus on revenue and revenue growth. But of course, that doesn't achieve our objectives unless it comes with profitable growth and improving cash flows. 2012 to 2014 has been marked as a period of heavy investment. It's been an investment in the transformation. That's been high capex, spectrum purchases, network expansion, new products uh, and services, and an increase in the centralization. And all of that has brought higher operating costs. We see the period 2015 to 2017 as a period to turn that around and drive towards our ambition of a 20% EBITDA minus capex margin, our OCF margin that we talk about. And then this section, I'm going to look at the drivers on that. So you can see, and, and you're no doubt aware, I mean, the group has given up about eight uh, percentage points of EBITDA margin. Um, just over a quarter of that has been in the gross margin, which essentially is the mix shift that we've talked about. The rest of it has been an, op uh, an investment in OPEX. 
Um, you know, as I sort of said earlier, as, as our business continues to change, uh, we, we have to be realistic. We expect further impacts on our gross margin. So to, re to achieve our EBITDA targets, um, you know, we've, we will need a clear focus on managing our cost line. And that's what I want to discuss in the next couple of slides. So let me start by talking about the efficiency measures we're taking. I have to say that I'm you know, very encouraged that this process was well, on, well underway by the time I arrived. Um, we've had McKinsey reviewing our business model, out of which we have established programs in place focusing not just on re-engineering our business processes, but also on how we can save money. We know that to be successful in Africa, we've got to change the model. Um, one aspect of this is a managed service deal we've recently announced um, or recently concluded and I'll pick up on in a minute. And then finally, you know, we have increased our central organization uh, to handle this transformation and again that's worthy of discussion in a minute. So let me just sort of kick off with some of the efficiency programs and what we're doing here. <clears throat> uh, we looked at our mobile business in Guatemala. Um, you know, in some ways, it's a good place to start. It's a very well-run business. Um, but if we can find efficiency savings there, we can find them across our group. Um, <coughs> as a result of what we've done uh, in Guatemala, we have uh, basically 21 um, efficiency programs now in place. Uh, to a question that was asked earlier, the gross impact of that will be 2.7 percentage points of revenue. Um, that is a gross impact. Don't expect to see that as a net impact. There are obviously other costs and uh, other uh, investments we need to make. But you can see that these are meaningful um, uh, opportunities. With programs running on network efficiency, that's from site rentals to power saving to O&M rationalization. And you know, we see lots of opportunity here. And you can see from the slide about 42% of the savings will come from this area. We also see big opportunities in our sales and distribution channel, everything from reload and connection commissions to offer rationalizations and uh, an AMP. There's too much for, it, for us to go into here, but you know, I'd like to assure you that these actions are taking place now. Uh, we've extended the work we've done um, in uh, Guatemala. We've extended it to Bolivia, El Salvador, and now to uh, Tanzania with the aim of improving our efficiency <coughs> improving our future growth and improving our uh, OPEX ratios. And I can change the slide. <coughs> I, I, um, I'll give you another example. I mean, I just talked about Africa and there's been a bit of discussion on margins in Africa. Um, and I think there was an earlier question about network quality. You know, what I want to try and do is sort of encompass it in, in this slide. Um, we had a project called uh, Project Phoenix. Uh, it was a project designed to address a number of issues. Um, we needed to standardize our local operations. We needed to centralize our strategic initiatives, improve uh, our investment control, outsource the passive infrastructure, and leverage vendor economies of scale. All of those things to drive better network experience, better network quality at uh, a more efficient cost. You saw that we, um, we completed much of the uh, tower sales in 2013 and recently we announced our managed service deal with Ericsson and Huawei. This will reduce our network headcount by around 600 heads. Uh, it'll bring us cost savings of 16.3% on the baseline and all within a framework of improving the quality of service, uh, which we tried to demonstrate on this slide. So these are all big steps to reflect our, de our determination to bring uh, the organization for the future uh, to our Africa business. Now I want to spend a bit of time on um, our corporate costs. Many of you have uh, pointed out to me um, over the last couple of months that the corporate costs have risen significantly over the last two years. So what is it we're spending the money on? I think, I think the first thing to say is that the model that Millicom had in 2012 is not viable today. Uh, to deliver the vision you've heard about uh, during the course of today will require more central leadership. Um, the growth of the central organization goes hand in hand with the delivery of our digital lifestyle. However, 
I, I want to start and make it clear that, that the head office costs are not a, real, a, a rapid escalation of our back office um, people. What we've done in this slide is, is sort of in the pie chart, we've put the central functions into four groupings. Um, the corporate centre, which are the conventional head office uh, functions like finance, legal or HR. We've got the divisional leadership, uh, which, is our, which covers our LATAM and Africa, uh, plus our cable uh, team. And then we have shared operations, which is largely the organisation of uh, the technical side of Xavier's team that are uh, covering technical functions plus procurement. And then finally, we've got new business. Today, we've got about 424 people in our corporate centre. And as you can see, the biggest increase has come from new business. This was virtually non-existent uh, two years ago. Uh, today, we've got about 40 people in that. And these are the guys who are developing the things you've been hearing about today, the things that are um, shown at the back, our M-learning products, our OTT applications like Video On Demand, Second Screen, and much more. Um, we've also seen a large increase in our shared operations headcount. We've increased it by about 130, or we've drafted in about 130. And that has um, really been focused on Africa and, um, and enhanced procurement, where we, we see a lot of opportunities in our procurement um, uh, op operation. It also has been enhancing our customer service delivery, our business support, business intelligence, uh, work in progress. What I see here is we are double running in some areas. What we've done is, uh, and inevitably, we've built up the operation in the center with, uh, without reducing it in the, uh, in the businesses. That will normalize over time. Um, we, do, we, we are sort of overburdened at this particular point. Final group is a divisional leadership where, um, where we've added about 20 further heads. Um, mainly the Africa regional team, and again, that largely didn't exist in 2012. And I think you've seen the results from Arthur's presentation today, you know, the, uh, the focus those guys are bringing to our business there, driving results. Uh, without it, I doubt whether we would have seen those uh, results. So the total cost uh, in this financial year, we're estimating at about $280 million. About 60% of these are employee-related costs. Clearly, it's a big number. And we're going to have to um, evaluate uh, uh, or demonstrate value for money. Uh, there are a number of costs in this bucket, which are uh, basically shared costs. Uh, for instance, uh, we carry the cost of uh, the LTIP program. We carry the cost of group insurance. We carry some uh, external fees and, um, and charges in relation to our uh, intercompany uh, structure in the center. So you know, it, it's pretty hard to benchmark it. But the work that McKinsey have done for us in benchmarking our head office tells us that, you know, yes, we're up there now with the benchmark below. We were, b before we were, we were pretty low, but we're not wildly out of line. And I, I view my job now as to make sure that we're getting good value for money out of our central costs and that it delivers the, um, the objectives that the group has set out uh, during the course of this day. Okay. I want to uh, turn to our capital policies now. How do we look at investment? Uh, how do we manage the balance sheet? What are our shelled returns policy? Let me start with leverage. I expect us to be uh, cash negative in 2015, coming to break even uh, in uh, around 2016. And our leverage oh, will, be be will peak at just over 2.1 times on a consolidated basis. Incidentally, all of our covenants are based on a consolidated basis. If I look at this on a proportionate basis, you're looking at one and a half to two and a half times, and we're about two and a half times proportionate net debt to uh, proportionate EBITDA. Historically, we've run in the range of one to two times. Um, I see that as an appropriate range. Today, we're at the top of that range, and we're seeking opportunities to, uh, to deleverage. And you know, my target is that we bring this back down into the middle of the range in order to give the group flexibility to continue uh, the momentum that we've seen over the last couple of years. I want to turn to CapEx. Um, the last CMD, we set out a CapEx target of reducing CapEx to sales to 15%. Now, I can certainly see the migration path to that, 15% uh, on core CapEx against the original time frame. And then just looking at the CapEx evolution, we've spent pretty heavily over the last couple of years. CapEx to uh, revenue ratio has, has averaged just under 
and uh, just under 23% if we add spectrum purchases. But this does reflect a pretty heavy investment period. We've upgraded our 3G and 4G networks uh, across many businesses. We've, we've extended our coverage push into Africa. Uh, we've expanded our cable business pretty aggressively. And we've co uh, it's coincided with a batch of new 4G spectrum that we've acquired as well, plus some license renewals. We've still got some 4G spectrum to acquire. Um, that will fall, we expect, into the next uh, two years, uh, plus our license renewal in Bolivia. So by 2017, our view is that we should have most of the spectrum and licenses renewed, and um, you know, we shouldn't have a significant um, impact from spectrum then. So obviously, managing our capex will be crucial if we're to achieve our operating cash flow targets. Um, and that's why we've revamped our capex approval processes, upgraded our returns criteria uh, that we use in the evaluation of the capex uh, investments that we do make. So <coughs> this year we have uh, changed the composition of our cash flow targets. Uh, you know, a, a couple of you have kind of come up to me in the break and asked me how it reconciles to the previous targets. You know, these are not significantly different. My preference is we look at EBITDA minus CAPEX. Historically, we've looked at EBITDA minus CAPEX minus tax. Um, you know, I think it's simpler for us to look at EBITDA minus uh, CAPEX. That is what management can, can, can manage. Um, and what we're telling you today is that um, we see no reduction in our ambition on, cap on cash flow targets. In fact, um, you know, we see that we have a base, um, we've based our EBITDA minus CAPEX targets uh, on our ambition. Um, and, you know, with that, w we may see some uh, flexibility within the EBITDA margin. I think Hans Olga talked about it a little bit earlier. What we don't want to do is constrain the ability of our business, particularly our Colombian business, to uh, achieve the market, uh, the market uh, opportunity that it has by constraining its ability on, on EBITDA. But what we do believe we can do is deliver a hard number on the operating cash flow. So that's what we'll be focusing on in the main. And you can judge us by the progression against EBITDA and, uh, and CapEx. But we'll be, um, we'll be focused very hard on the, um, on the overall target of a 20% OCF margin by 2017. I think for those of you that, that want to do the maths against the previous target, our run rate on taxes is somewhere between 300 and 350 million dollars. So I think if you're able to get your calculator out, you'll see that we're still sticking pretty firmly to the original uh, targets now. So why are we driving OCF? It's because uh, we need to drive it for our return on capital. The group uh, at the moment uh, is, is a story of two halves. We've got our established businesses delivering return on invested capital well over 25%. And, and, you know, I'm super impressed with this. This is no mean feat in our business. I think, you know, the uh, Central America and South America returns are extraordinary, reflecting extraordinary businesses with extraordinary people running them. I think on the other side, um, we have, um, we've got an ROC below our cost of capital in Africa, and in fact, UNE will be considerably below, below its cost of capital. Uh, we see this as both a threat and an opportunity. We're not going to shy away from it. Um, we've talked about UNE and the great opportunity that we've got there. You know, can we, can we improve it? Can we grow it from a 1.6% return on capital to 9.5%? Well, I think, you know, you'll recall that uh, we achieved this with Tigo Columbia, which in 2007 had got a negative uh, return on capital. And by 2012, I think the team had, had turned that around and it was delivering, um, you know, an ROIC in excess of its uh, cost of capital. And I think from what you've seen today, we believe we can do that again. Obviously, Africa represents a different challenge, but we see the same opportunity. The reason why we are committed to the African business is because we see the opportunity there. And I think a company like Millicom should seize the opportunity and not be as afraid of the, uh, of the challenge. Um, <coughs> we've got about a net invested capital in Africa of about a billion dollars. Um, and, you know, we're targeting to reach an acceptable return from that investment on the strategy 
that we set out. And you know, you heard Arthur talk about return on capital. It is the way we look at um, the way we invest capital in in Africa, looking for um, you know strong returns to drive that up. And again, you can measure us by the way we move that that needle. You know, moving it from one and a half percent to um, to towards our thirteen and a half percent cost of capital for the for the continent. So let me pull it together in terms of, of our capital allocation policies, um, and I'll try and be clear on this. Um, our first, our intention now is to focus on deleveraging over the next couple of years. Uh, although we we certainly remain committed to our dividend policy, the dividend policy we've communicated in the past, shelled remuneration will remain primarily through the annual dividend during this period. On M and A. We aim for all acquisitions to achieve local uh, country uh, cost of capital. It will be very targeted. It will focus on in-market consolidation, particularly on the cable side. Um, but really, our, our primary focus over the next 18 to 24 months will be the integration of UNE and, and deleveraging. OK, so let me uh, wrap this up. We remain a strong growth company. That growth will become more evenly balanced through the P&L and the cash flow. We'll, we will maintain our strong focus on return on capital. Over the next two years, our capital efficiency focus will be on the balance sheet and improving returns on capital from our existing investments. And to be clear, our principal guidance from this CMD um, we're setting clear financial goals for the business. We're committed to delivering the revenue growth. Uh, we expect to be a nine billion plus revenue business by 2017. We don't believe in revenue growth without growth in returns, which is why we are recommitting to the 35% EBITDA margin, the 15% capex uh, uh, ratio. But our focus, as I've just said, will be more on the OCF margin than the EBITDA margin. Our return criteria will move from uh, we'll move to achieving a premium over our cost of capital. But before we set guidance on that, uh, we need to have a path to bring UNE and Africa to uh, positive economic profit. With that, I will open the floor to uh, questions. Thank you, uh, Erik Persch, Danske Bank again. Uh, I was looking at um, just the, the targets for net debt from last year's CMD, and um, the, the phrasing then was that uh, uh, you aim for net debt to EBITDA around two times with a rapid target to return to around one time net debt to EBITDA. Now it seems like it's a uh, modestly rapid sort of return to about 1.5 times uh, EBITDA. So could you, could you sort of reconcile what, what has been uh, happening in that sense over the past 18 months? Not really, because I wasn't here. <laughs> Look, I mean, all I can say is that um, I can see that the right target for this group is one to two times uh, EBITDA. You saw from my slide, we're going to be in just a tad above that. We're going to be about 2.1 times by the middle of 2015. And, you know, our focus is on bringing that back. The, the reason for bringing that back is to give ourselves headroom to do things. Um, you know, I, I think realistically the best place for us to be is the middle of the range you know I think if we you know we took it further that is probably telling you that we don't have enough opportunities to invest in our business to drive um, you know kind of good returns uh, in the future and I you know I see this I, I, you know, that is not going to be a problem in this business. You know, since I've been in here, the number of opportunities are, are legion. There's lots of opportunities, you know, and, and I certainly don't want us to be in a position where we're not taking good, profitable opportunities. But for now, you know, we have a twofold focus. One is our management is focused on Colombia, and secondly, our capital has been deployed there. So we need to bring the margins back. I think the middle of the range gives adequate flexibility, it gives us. Um, actually, it gives us several, several billion dollars of, um, of headroom in terms of, our, of where we can take uh, you know, future EBITDA. So for me, one and a half times would be a comfortable sort of landing spot before we, uh, we started to look again. As a, as a quick follow-up, maybe. Um, 
as you have probably quite limited uh, real near term to the leverage, would it be fair to assume that any acquisitions would be have to be balanced out by disposals? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think we've talked about our acquisitions. Hans Holger sort of essentially ruled out big acquisitions in this period. <coughs> the, um, there will be bolt-on acquisitions. We see quite a lot of um, cable businesses, for instance, but they're, they're relatively small. They're typically in the, you know, five, ten million dollars, maybe twenty million dollars as a big deal. So I don't see, you know, I don't see it quite being like that. That we have to sort of sell one to buy one. You know, there, are, there will be uh, opportunities for us to to grow inorganically, although it's relatively small. Um, but you know, at, at the end of the day, we um, you know we we'll remain focused on our targets. And um, you know, if, if one of the way to get to the targets is to um, is to sell something, then we'll sell it. You've seen that we sold in Q2. <laughs> we announced the disposal of the Mauritius business and um, the Towers business in in Colombia. And, and I'm determined to wear them because I've got lots of ties. And, and if I don't wear them at events like this, I'll never wear them. So I, I hope you like my tie. OK, Mattis. Uh, when it comes to Africa, how many countries are actually meeting the return requirements, 13.5%? None. None. Was that the question, or is there a follow-on? <laughs> <laughs> no follow-up. <laughs> I mean, you know, Africa, uh, you know, it's tempting to say none of them meet the hurdle, just get rid of it. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of time looking at this. We think that's the wrong thing to do. We think there is a huge opportunity in Africa. The potential is there. Now, you know, whether we can grasp that potential, um, you know, remains to be seen. That's down to our execution capabilities. But, you know, Millicom is not a group that gives up on things. And I, and I don't think, you know, under this, this team... It will be a group that gives up on things. If we can find a way through the digital lifestyle strategy we've outlined uh, um, to effectively monetize our investment there, then we will do that. And, and I think the proof of this should be the growth of the ROIC over time rather than, you know, can we hit a 13.5% um, target in, in three years' time? I think, I think I'd be generally satisfied if we see that sort of incrementally creeping up each year, then I feel we will be doing, um, you know, the right job there. Sorry, let's go to this side. Uh, uh, Sven Schall at Swedbank again. Um, just wondering about uh, the level of depreciation in UNE. Uh, 